All right. We have dealt with our introduction to the history of Christian ethics by reading Wagaman. Uh, by the way, I saw Wagaman on TV the other night. He was uh, discussing something about... He, he, he is the minister of the church where uh, Clinton was a member. So uh, he gets on TV every once in a while. But uh, now that we've kind of gone through Wagaman, we need to start on Paul Ramsey, Basic Christian Ethics. Because with Paul Ramsey, we're actually getting into a more systematic understanding of ethics. Now, if you read Ramsey, you will still be sent back over and over again to Augustine and to Luther and to uh, even to Kierkegaard. And uh, that's absolutely necessary because what Ramsey's trying to do is to explicate the meaning of Christian ethics. And one of the things Ramsey makes clear in his first chapter is that when you're doing Christian ethics, you're doing the Bible. Ethics of a rationalistic, secular type may change quite often as people go through uh, different phases of culture and intellectual history. Christian ethics will also change quite often as it, as it interfaces with history and with culture. But Christian ethics, even as it changes, will always still have its roots in the Bible. So whereas uh, a utilitarian ethic or a, a, some other kind of modern ethic uh, may hang very loosely to anything that precedes it, even though it may have something to say about Plato or Aristotle or um, even some medieval ethicists, Christian ethics cannot hang loosely to the Bible. It always has to go back to the Bible because, the, because Christian ethics is a religious ethic. It is a theological ethic. It is not a rational ethic. It is based on the story. You have to know about Abraham. You have to know about Adam and Eve and the meaning of the story of Adam and Eve. You, ne you have to know the story of Abraham, the meaning of the story of Abraham. You have to know the meaning of the story of Joseph, the meaning of the story of Moses. And then you have to know uh, the meaning of what the prophets say in response to the, to the um, rejection by Israel of the ethical norms and of the covenant. In other words, the, one of the key words in all of that statement is the word story. You don't have to know any story to study Aristotle's ethics. You don't have to know any story to study Plato's ethics. You don't really have to have any, know any story to study Buddhist, the Buddhist way of looking at things, uh, or the Hindu way of looking at things. When you, when you look at the story of the Bible, you're looking at what from the perspective of Jews and Christians is the history of God's relationship with human beings. So in Christian and Jewish ethics, you know what you're supposed to do by knowing God, knowing the character of God. So uh, if we, uh, as we start out in Ramsey then, we start out by discussing the two sources of Christian love. We've already indicated that the theme of Christian ethics uh, is a continuation of the theme of Jewish ethics, and the theme of both ethics is the ethic of love. Uh, when a rabbi was asked what is the greatest commandment, he would say the same thing that Jesus said. That is, the greatest commandment is that you should love the Lord your God. And the second commandment was to love your neighbor as yourself. And as Jesus says, the law and the prophets, all of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. In other words, if you understand these two commandments, then you understand what the law and the prophets are trying to explain. And these two commandments, you should love God and you should love your neighbor, indicates that Christian ethics is rooted in knowing God, having a relationship with God. It's not rooted in trying to find out 
what is right, separate and apart from God. So the two sources of Christian love are the righteousness of God, which is uh, in, in a Hebrew Bible concept, and the kingdom of God in the teachings of Jesus. You cannot understand the New Testament, which is the basis of Christian ethics, without understanding the Old Testament, which is the basic of Jewish ethics. Jesus was, Jesus God was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He wasn't a different God. And so Jesus is attempting to express what the righteousness of God is. In fact, from the Christian perspective, even the appearance of Jesus in history is an expression of the righteousness of God, is an expression of the love of God. As uh, Ramsey makes clear, uh, it's not only that you look at the life of Jesus. You do look at the life of Jesus and you see how Jesus treated people. That's very important. And you, you see that Jesus uh, was, uh, uh, had disinterested love, that is, love that was not... Uh, love that was not based on the uh, the value or the not the value but based on the merit of the person that he loved uh, as Paul puts it while we were yet sinners that is while we were in rebellion against God Christ died for us and so Jesus shows this kind of love in all of his relationships he 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 shows a an interest in in the well-being of uh, prostitutes, which the religious establishment did not have much interest in. He shows, except in terms of condemnation or judgment, he shows his interest in the well-being of foreigners, which uh, according to some strict uh, Jewish culture, uh, God really didn't have much interest in. He showed uh, his interest in Samaritans, which from the perspective of the religious establishment um, was, uh, was something extraordinary. The, the story of the Good Samaritan, for instance, is the story of uh, Jesus' interest in the, in the well-being and the understanding of a group of people that from the perspective of the religious establishment were not worth understanding. He showed respect and an interest in women, which was extraordinary and just totally uh, clashed with the cultural understanding of, of the value of women. And, but in this, Jesus is not in opposition to the biblical faith of the Jews. What Jesus is trying to do, according to the writers of the gospel, is to actually, actually explicate the meaning of the biblical faith. And what Jesus saw, according to the New Testament, was the same thing that the prophets saw. And that is the religious establishment generally is a defender and a warrantor of the status quo, and the status quo is usually never, is almost never the will of God. Because the status quo uh, reverts back to idolatry or reverts back to the way people are treated without the covenant, without understanding the nature of God. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of Jesus' conflict with the religious authorities of his day was later interpreted by Christianity. This, this became a problem in the history of Christianity because it was later interpreted by some uh, defenders of Christianity in a kind of an anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic way. And so lots of anti-Semitic thought, particularly in the Middle Ages and even before the Middle Ages, sometimes justified itself on the basis of Jesus' conflict with the religious authorities. But Jesus' conflict with religious authorities was not anti-Judaism or anti-Semitism. Uh, Jesus' conflict with the religious authorities was, was, a, was an example of his prophetic interest. In other words, he was a prophet. And Isaiah had conflict with the 
religious establishment. Amos had conflict with the religious establishment. Hosea had conflict with the religious establishment. That wasn't in conflict with, quote, Jewish God or even with the Jewish people. It was a conflict with the, with the unfaithfulness from the perspective of the prophets of the Jewish people to the covenant. Christianity should have been able to have transferred that to its own uh, critique. In other words, the same thing that applies to the Jewish establishment at the time of Jesus also applies to the Christian establishment after the time of Jesus. And uh, it, you, you'll remember last time we talked about Kierkegaard. Uh, Kierkegaard was uh, not a prophet in exactly the same sense the Old Testament Jewish prophets were, but he was a prophet in the sense that nobody in the religious establishment liked him. In fact, they hated him because he pointed out the fact that the religious establishment uh, was not faithful or true to the God of the Bible. The religious establishment was not faithful to the covenant. The religious establishment intellectually believed in Christianity, but it did not live Christianity. Well, that didn't mean that Kierkegaard was anti-Christian. It certainly didn't mean he was anti-Christ or anti-Christian ethics. That meant that he was radically in favor of Christianity and radically in favor of the Christian faith and radically in favor of Christian ethics. He just believed that the religious establishment, in this case Christians, in Denmark, were not faithful to the covenant. So in that, in that sense, uh, Jesus' conflict, uh, as described in the Gospels, is a conflict among Jews. It's not a conflict of Christians against Jews. Jesus was not a Christian. He was never a Christian. You know, he was born a Jew, he lived a Jew, and when he died he was a Jew. So all of his conflict in his life was not a conflict between Christianity and Jews. It was a conflict among Jews about the meaning of the covenant, about the meaning of the law, about the meaning of uh, faithfulness and the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God refers to the concept in the Bible. In fact, the Bible has sometimes been called the book of God's righteousness. The righteousness of God, his judgment and his faithful, his steadfast faithfulness to the covenant he makes with men is not only frequently mentioned in the Bible, but is its main theme. In other words, biblical ethics doesn't start out with a kind of a rational assessment of what's right and wrong or what's good and evil. It begins, it begins with the good in the Hebrew sense, that is the righteousness of God. If you want to know, if you want to know what the good is, you need to understand who God is and what kind of character God is. The meaning and measure of full human obligation are to be found only in the biblical conception of righteousness and not elsewhere in some moral norms derived from reason operating apart from the Hebrew Christian religious heritage. What I tried to point out last class period is that there's nothing you can do about that. So uh, some people... Uh, who might have attended this class or some people who might watch it over TV might kind of get out of sorts because this class talks so much about God. Well, if you don't want to be in a class that talks about God, then you don't want to be in a class in Christian ethics because Christian ethics is not derived from somewhere else. It's not derived from just a rational understanding or a rational kind of analysis of moral norms. And that, as I said last time, is, is a, part of the, uh, a, a great part of some tension that's going on now in the United States. Uh, uh, sometimes this is uh, labeled as culture wars. Well, uh, a lot of what a lot of people have to say about culture wars, I think, is uh, misleading. 
But on the other hand, there is a tension in the United States uh, between people uh, for whom the Judeo-Christian ethic or Jewish ethics and Christian ethics still has a great deal of importance. We're going to talk, for instance, about the difference between the American concept of justice and the Judeo-Christian concept of justice. The American concept of justice owes a great deal to its Judeo-Christian background. But the American concept of justice cannot be equated with the, with the biblical concept of justice. You remember when we were talking about tolerance? Tolerance is a wonderful pagan virtue. And it is a virtue that every Christian, from the biblical perspective, should be at least tolerant. But tolerance is not good enough from the perspective of uh, the biblical understanding of ethics. Tolerance is kind of the, uh, the lowest common denominator. You should be at least tolerant. All right, in the same way, uh, the American concept of justice, that is equality before the law, particularly equality of opportunity and so forth, is wonderful. <laughs> we need to be at least in favor of equality of opportunity. But equality of not opportunity is not a full definition of justice from the biblical perspective. Because from the biblical perspective, not all people, even if they have equality of opportunity, uh, are able to participate in the good things that God wants them to participate in. And so uh, Jewish and Christian justice uh, goes on from equality of opportunity and equality before the law. It goes on to uh, a more proactive interest in the well-being of people who, even if they're equal before the law, are still hurting and who are in need of things that Christians and uh, Christians can provide. And so, human obligation. is more than just providing an equal playing field, or a level playing field. Now, as I say, we ought to at least be in favor of that. Some Christians, if you listen to them talk, are not even particularly in favor of an equal playing, or a level playing field. And so, uh, that understanding of Christian ethics needs to come under critique. But, uh, but from the perspective of the biblical view, the prophetic view, the view of uh, the righteousness of God, a level playing field is kind of the sine qua non, it's kind of the beginning. You go on from there. Because even a level playing field does not necessarily provide justice for, uh, for some people. So human obligation is found only in the biblical conception of righteousness. Ramsey points out, for instance, that that even the medieval conception of charity is a step beyond the modern conception or the Aristotelian conception of justice. The Aristotelian conception of justice is corrective justice. That is, if you steal somebody's $5 bill, Justice requires that you in some way be forced to compensate that man for the loss of his $5 bill. That's corrective justice. And so Aristotelian justice is a, is a rational concept, conception of justice, which from the perspective of medi even medieval people, people should be at least that just, but people need to be just in a, in a broader sense, in that they, that they need to be charitable, even that is, even if they haven't stolen five dollars from somebody who needs five dollars, they supply the five dollars. You see how that goes beyond, it's a concept of justice that goes beyond just corrective justice. Um, so, so moral norms in Christianity are derived from the Hebrew Christian religious heritage and not from somewhere else. The first sentence in chapter 1 
Ramsey says, the first thing to be said concerning Christian ethics is that it cannot be separated from its religious foundation. Now, in, sometimes in talking about the relationship of Christian ethics to public ethics or to our society, uh, people make the point that you do not have to base ethics on religion. Well, that's true. It's obvious that you don't have to base ethics on religion. But if you're a Christian, you can't base your ethics on anything else. You can contribute to a more uh, general ethic. But you can't begin as a Christian on some other ethical norm besides the Christian perspective. Now, a lot of people think that the only thing that religion contributes to ethics is that it gives you a supernatural law enforcer who gets mad at you if you don't do what's right and he punishes you if you don't do what's right. Uh, this is true not because of some tender-minded belief that supernatural sanctions are needed to enforce right conduct, which it is thought may be adequately defined without any reference at all to religion. In other words, God is just out there to be kind of the referee or the judge. And uh, right and wrong is derived from some other source. But God just is, is the enforcer. He's just the supernatural enforcer. In chapter, uh, on page uh, 12 of the same chapter, whoever imagines that religion adds to ethics only the threat of supernaturally administered punishment has simply never read the Bible. So what is right what is just, from the biblical perspective, is not ba just uh, doing what is right and what is just is not simply based on deriving the content of rightness and justness from somewhere else and then having God enforce it. Rightness and justice from the biblical perspective is actually derived from the character of God. The righteousness of God and the justice of men are ordinarily distinguished in the Bible. Now you have to understand... Uh, I just need to stop and make this comment. You, you have to understand that Ramsey wrote this book before the modern sensitivity toward inclusive language. And so as you read him, he will use the word men in the inclusive sense. And he is using it in the inclusive sense. It may not, uh, it may not, uh, uh, it, it may not suit uh, modern sensitivities. And so... Uh, we, need to, we need probably to say that the righteousness of God and the justice of human beings or the justice of men and women are ordinarily distinguished in the Bible. God's righteousness acting in judgment is regularly designated by the word tzedak. While human justice formulated by judgments in courts of law and given in informal custom is the primary meaning of mishpat. Now these, of course, are transliter transliterations um, of the Hebrew word because uh, I assume that you would not be able to read the Hebrew word if it was put there in Hebrew. Some of you probably could. But uh, tzedak and mishpat are words that can be used to refer to two different aspects of righteousness, the righteousness of God and the righteousness of human beings. But what Ramsey is going to point out is that the more you read in the Bible, the more you realize that these two concepts of righteousness are inextricable. You can't know what the righteousness of, that human beings are obligated to do without knowing what the righteousness of God is. Now, part of this uh, distinction between the righteousness of God and the justice of human beings is also part of the problem that such concepts as the two kingdoms in Luther are trying to deal with. In other words, and also when Paul talks about the emperor being the servant of God to execute judgment, you know, he says the, the emperor does not carry the sword in vain. In other words... Even the emperor, even though he's not a Christian, he's a pagan, is in one sense the servant of God because 
he is the only thing between uh, between civilization and chaos, so to speak. In other words, we may we may not consider the Roman civilization to be very high or very sensitive, especially if you. Uh, if you saw the recent movie, The Gladiator, you know, there's, uh, uh, th there's kind of a feeling, at least on the part of most modern people, that the Roman civilization was not very sensitive, particularly in respect to violence and human life and so forth. Well, uh, that's true. The reason why we are so sensitive to human life and violence, even though we are still very violent, is because what has intervened in the meantime, is the biblical concept of justice. And, uh, and so we might look back at the Roman Empire as, as a very cruel, um, insensitive kind of civilization. On the other hand, it was probably as just a civilization uh, as ever existed up to that point. Because when you look at ancient history and the violence of ancient history, um, uh, they didn't have any more violence than we have, but it was understood in a different way than we, what we understand it. Even though we go around in the 20th century killing people all the time, we still say that's not the right thing to do. <laughs> but if you live in a civilization where killing people is actually the right thing to do, then you're going to have a very different... Uh, very different uh, mindset. So even Nero, that's the that's the that's the that's the emperor that Paul is referring to as being the servant of God. Even Nero is the servant of God. Now Nero, of course, uh, was uh, fairly depraved and crazy, particularly during the latter part of his reign. But he still represented law and justice. And so some people did get justice because of the power of the sword that was uh, inherent in the, in the Roman government. Just like some people in America get justice because of the power that's inherent in our justice system. Uh, we shouldn't be so uh, naive as to think that everybody in America gets justice. So, in that sense, uh, we still have a long way to go, just like the Roman Empire had a long way to go. But, there, but most theologians still try to distinguish between justice in the sense of ordinary law courts and justice in the sense of the righteousness of God. Uh, Ramsey, for instance, illustrates that by talking about Bart and Bonhoeffer, and, uh, and later on he'll talk about Niebuhr, in which, from their perspective, they know that the Bible doesn't do this. But from their perspective, in modern terms, we have to distinguish between justice and love. Because the state, as Bart says, can know nothing of love. Well, that doesn't mean the state is a horrible thing. That just means that the highest ethically that a state can, can attain is to a to a proximate, approximate justice, approximate justice. Even uh, no state can can attain to perfect or true justice, but the state can attain to a kind of proximate justice. But that's the highest it can attain to. But that doesn't mean that Christians who are part of the government should. Uh, should satisfy themselves with this kind of proximate justice because Christians going into the government also should have a concept of the righteousness of God. And um, so, uh, as Bruner puts it, the love of the Christian gospel sometimes appears between the lines, even in a government or even in a uh, society that... that, that has some impact from Christian justice. One of the, uh, it's interesting that one of the great uh, uh, conflicts going on recently has to do with pardon power. 
And it's unfortunate that pardon power is coming under such, such uh, criticism because pardon power is one of the, th one of the aspects of, Amer of the American justice system which most approximates the biblical conception of tzedek, of justice. Because pardon power supposedly is the ability of somebody who has, who has a concept of righteousness or justice in his mind who is going to defend somebody, for instance, from overzealous prosecutors or from overzealous law enforcers. That's what the pardon, that's what the pardon uh, power is supposed to be. And that's the reason why uh, it was kind of left uh, in the Constitution as an unchallenged power. In other words, there's no legal basis upon which to, there's no legal basis upon which to challenge the pardon power of a governor or the pardon power of a president. That's what pardon power means, that it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a power that goes beyond the ordinary justice system and takes into consideration other things. And so in a sense, it's uh, supposedly, it, not, it doesn't necessarily work out this way because the people who are given pardon power are also human beings and they may, uh, they may use it in a totally uh, uh, wrong way. But still, pardon power is extremely important because it gives at least somebody in our justice system the power to show mercy, to defend the weak, to defend the, uh, the, uh, the people without power. As for instance, in the case of uh, some of the women that were recently pardoned who had been given 15 years to life in prison, federal prison, for having a few ounces of uh, cocaine or something that they were carrying for their boyfriends. Meanwhile, their boyfriends didn't get 15, <laughs> 15 uh, years to life or the drug pusher didn't get 15 years to life because uh, uh, they got deals. But the poor women who were just kind of caught up in this, and they themselves were dope, uh, were drug addicts, but they were just kind of caught up in this. They got, the, they got worse sentences than the uh, dealers did. And so those are, those, those are a, a number of the people that were pardoned by Clinton uh, were people like this. So some of his pardons were, um, were the proper use of pardon power. But pardon power, in a sense, uh, goes beyond the idea of corrective justice. Because corrective justice doesn't always correct. The connecting link between divine righteousness and human justice is the covenant and the events believed to have occasioned Israel's origin as a religious nation. That's the story I'm talking about. The covenant promulgates the justice of God on earth. God's righteousness becomes the plumb line for measuring the rightness of human relationships. I think they should put that on. Yeah, this needs to go on the screen. The connecting link between divine justice and human justice is the covenant and the events believed to have occasioned God, Israel's origin as a religious nation. The covenant promulgates the justice of God on earth. God's righteousness becomes the plumb line for measuring the rightness, righteousness of human relationships. Can I say something? Yes. That statement that Ramsey is making that God's righteousness becomes the plumb line for measuring the rightness of human relationships. If humanity is, is a product of in, in the biblical concept or Christian concept of the fall, it seems that in that alone, we, no matter what we can do, can live up to the aspect of God's righteousness. That's right. In other words, uh, when you're talking about the fall, now I want to 
reiterate again that from the biblical perspective, because this is badly misunderstood, from the biblical perspective, human beings are essentially good. That is, they were created good. But the, uh, the fall means, as you say, the fall means, as you say, that every aspect of human existence, including human reason and human thought, has been damaged to the extent that human beings can no longer attain to the righteousness of God by their own thinking or by their own action. So, in a sense, the plumb line has to fall from heaven. And when the plumb line comes from heaven, then human beings looking at the plumb line, which is the covenant and the law of God and the character of God, can judge whether they are what they are doing or they are being what they were created to be, what they were created to do. And so that's what we mean by saying that, that Jewish and Christian ethics is based in the character of God. And if you don't know God from Jewish and Christian perspective, then you cannot know what you're supposed to do. And so that's the reason why God has to take the initiative. Because from, from the philosophical perspective, a, phil a philosopher is trying, to, is trying to comprehend God through reason. From the biblical perspective, God cannot be comprehended through reason. You can't even find God through reason. God is beyond finding. He has to find you. So that's the story of the Bible, is that God has found us. He found Israel in Egypt, and he brought them out of Egypt. And then he said, I am the God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, therefore you shall do this. He doesn't start by saying, hey, y'all do this. He starts by saying, I am the God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, therefore you should do this. If you know me, then you know uh, what to do. And that, uh, that, in, in that way, the righteousness of God is the plumb line. You had something? So in other words, he sets the standard. Yes, he is the standard. He is the standard. And so from the Jewish Christian perspective, that's the reason why the Bible is so important. Uh, you have to read the story. You have to hear the story in order to understand what God, who God is, what he is like, and what he wants. If, God, if, if the character of God was not righteousness, then there would be no basis, according to the Bible, for an ethic of righteousness. For instance, if your God was was uh, one, of the one of the deities that surrounded Israel at the time. Say your god was Moloch. Any of you ever seen a picture of Moloch? You know what Moloch is? In other words, when, when Exodus 20 says, you shall have no other gods before me, it's gods like Moloch and Baal that, the, that uh, Exodus has in mind. It's, he's not just saying, well, you got... 20 or 30 pretty good gods out here, but I'm jealous, so I want you to like me. <laughs> what, what Exodus is saying is, uh, there is only one God out there who is, who is going to uh, be beneficial for you to worship. There's only one God out there who has the character by which you should judge what you should be. For instance, if you're worshiping Moloch, what is, what is Moloch's character? What does Moloch like to do? What? Sacrifice kids. That's right. Moloch likes to eat children. Now that's his character. <laughs> Moloch likes to eat children. People sacrifice children to Moloch in order to get on his good side. Now, do you see the context in which this statement is made? I am the God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall have no other gods before me. It's not just a matter of, you know, you go to your church and I go to mine. It's not just a matter of differences in religious denominations. It's a matter of the difference in the character of God, the absolute difference in the character of God. If you want to worship, continue to worship Moloch, you will continue, for instance, to offer your children as sacrifices. And all Moloch is, is a big sacrifice pit. Moloch, Moloch was the god of uh, lots of people in the Middle East, including 
the god of the uh, of Carthage. You remember the war between uh, Hannibal and Rome? One of the best books I've ever read, the one, one that uh, has influenced a great deal of my thought, and some people may think this is for the good or for the bad, is a book by G.K. Chesterton entitled The Everlasting Man. Let me just uh, put that down. It's, uh, I think it's still in print because uh, G.K. Chesterton has been associated with with uh, C.S. Lewis and everything that has any connection with C.S. Lewis is still in print. The Everlasting Man by G.K. Chesterton, who was a Roman Catholic layman, uh, who a lot of people think is a kind of a linguistic dilettante. But uh, on the other hand, he is still extremely interesting to read because he has such a powerful way with words. And in The Everlasting Man, one of the chapters is entitled The War Between the Gods. Now, G.K. Chesterton is kind of a Christian apologist. He's a Roman Catholic Christian apologist. And so he's going to tell the story of the war between Hannibal and Rome in a way that, uh, that throws good light, or at least positive light, on Christianity. But that's going to be hard to do because the war between Hannibal and Rome has nothing to do with Christianity. So what does he do in the story? He makes the point that the war between Hannibal and Rome, between Carthage and Rome, even though we look back on it as just another one of those ancient battles that uh, we have to study in history, he looks on it, he says that it's one of the most important wars in human history because it determined a great deal of the character of Western culture. He, what he's saying is that here is a war between the Roman gods and the god of Carthage. And there's a difference even between the character of pagan gods. As, as insensitive and as violent and as warlike as the Roman gods were, they couldn't hold a candle to the despair and the violence and the, and the depravity of the god of Carthage, Moloch. Because when Hannibal went off to win his battle with Rome, he was sent off with the sacrifice of children. And if he came back with victory, it would have been celebrated with the sacrifice of children. Even the Roman gods didn't do that. And so what he's saying is, uh, even, though, even though that war has nothing to do with being Christian or non-Christian, it does have to do with the character of the gods. And if, if Hannibal had won that war, if Carthage had won that war, Chesterton said, we would be going to church, we would be getting our top hats on and going to church in London every Sunday morning and offering our children as human sacrifices. What would prevent it? In other words, the way a culture expresses itself is dependent on its conception of God. And so Carthage expressed itself culturally in terms of, of ch child sacrifice. Rome expressed itself in terms of the god Mars and things like that, which is not too high a conception of God, but it's higher, it's higher a conception of God than, the, than Moloch. Moloch is basically a furnace. And if you've ever seen a picture of Moloch, Moloch is a, is a furnace with his arms outstretched. And of course, Moloch is the kind of God that never moves. He just stands there with his arms outstretched. But inside of Moloch is a furnace. In other words, you go to the back and you open up the furnace and you put the coal or the wood in and you start the fire. It's just like uh, deacons used to get up in, in, out in the country and go to church early and start the fire. In order to worship in Carthage, one of the priests had to get up early in the morning and go out and stoke the fire. So that when the people got to worship with their children, the fire would be ready for them. And then their child would be laid on the arms of Moloch and would roll back into his mouth. 
you know, there's, there's kind of a modern popular liberal expression. It doesn't make any difference what you believe as long as you're sincere. Now, think of Moloch <laughs> when, you, when you repeat that idea. Think of Moloch. There's a, there's a kind of a uh, there's a kind of a ethical moral neutralism that's uh, kind of in the ascendancy in American academia, uh, where you're not supposed to make judgments about anything. Well, surely, whether there's a god or not, <laughs> we can make a judgment about whether worshiping Moloch is uh, good for human beings. Punch it. What? How they decide what kids can eat. Well, uh, it's different in, in different cultures, you know. Uh, human sacrifice is, is one of the most widespread forms of worship in the ancient world. Every, whatever your ethnic descent, you can be fairly certain that your ancestors participated in human sacrifice. In fact, it seems like that the Jews or the ancient Hebrews were the first person, were the first group of people to begin to try to overcome human sacrifice as a worship. And they had a hard time doing it. If you read the Bible, the Bible is the story of the people of Israel offering human sacrifices for most of their history. You had uh, David, who was somewhat of a monotheist. Then you had Solomon, David's son, who started out as a monotheist, but by the time he died, he was a polytheist, and he had established uh, the worship of various gods in Jerusalem, including the worship of some foreign gods in the temple. And, uh, and then when Solomon died, the, the kingdom of Israel split into two parts, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And... The southern kingdom sometimes was ruled by a monotheistic king. The northern kingdom never had a monotheistic king. And most of the kings of the southern kingdom were not monotheistic. So when you, when you read the prophets then, you're reading a prophetic outcry, not just against somebody who has a different religious perspective, than they're supposed to have. You have an outcry between people who do not understand God. They think that God wants human sacrifice. They think that God allows you to mistreat your neighbor. They think that God allows you to mistreat the poor. And from the prophetic perspective, you can tell. That's prima facie evidence that the people are not taking the covenant seriously if they are mistreating the poor. But mistreating the poor went along with, because the list of the sins of Israel and the list of the sins of the surrounding cultures included uh, mistreatment of the poor, the slave trade, human sacrifice, and you just name it. Whatever human beings have ever done that is unjust, uh, the people of Israel were involved in. And so the Israelites didn't really become uh, practical, practicing monotheists until after the Babylonian captivity. By the time Jesus was born, of course, the people of Israel are notorious for being intolerant of pagan gods. But before the Babylonian captivity, the people of Israel worshipped pagan gods as much as anybody else did. And so, in that sense, from the biblical perspective, the people of Israel were unfaithful to the covenant. Uh, the prophets, like Hosea, considered these foreign gods to be, to be different husbands for Israel. Israel should have only the God of Abraham as their husband. But they have gone off after these other husbands, these pagan gods. And the difference, again, is not just a religious, uh, difference of religious ideas. The difference is in the character of God. If you worship a God who, require, who eats children, who requires human sacrifice, 
then that is going to set the tone for your, for your ethical culture. You don't want to live next door to a person who worships Moloch. I mean, that's just the way it is. And so, uh, from, from the biblical perspective, uh, what Chesterton is saying is, this makes a difference. It makes a difference what you believe about the character of God. There's even a difference between the character of some pagan gods. And so we are fortunate that Rome won the war with Carthage. Otherwise, Christianity would have had to, Judaism and Christianity would have had to, had to overcome Moloch in Europe rather than just having to overcome the pagan gods of Rome and uh, Greece. There was, an, there was an article in the newspaper last week, for instance, if, uh, if this has any interest to you for your collection of newspaper articles, about the Moche people of Peru. Did you ever see that article? The Moche, it, this is an interesting article for me, and I'll explain why. The Moche people of Peru, like most of the peoples of South America, were practitioners of human sacrifice. There were thousands of people sacrificed, human beings sacrificed. For instance, in Mexico City, at the time uh, just before Columbus uh, sailed the ocean blue, there were about 20,000 people sacrificed in Mexico City, which was a pretty good percentage of the whole population of Mexico. But this was considered to be a, a, an integral part of their religion. And if you look at all of the archaeological sites in South America, you, if you look far enough, you will find either in their graves or in their, in their architecture a place for human sacrifice. Anyway, they just discovered some new graves of the Moche people of uh, Peru. And uh, there were two things interesting about this. One is that, <laughs> that it uh, was an illustration of human sacrifice, which is not funny. But the other is that uh, what they discovered is that the Moche people average height was four foot ten to five foot six. Which means I would have gotten along pretty well in, in the Moche culture. But I, really, I discovered that I would even, even have gotten along much better than I expected because in these graves where the important people were buried who were under five foot six, there were also some other people buried. And these were the people who were over five foot six. Now, what was the relationship between the people who were under five foot six and the people who were over five foot six? The relationship was the people who were under five foot six were the honored elite of the society. The people who were over five foot six were the human sacrifices. <laughs> And so, anyway, if you lived in the Moche community, uh, your mother better pray that you never got over five foot six. Because if you got over five foot six, then you were considered to be some kind of alien uh, and not really human. And uh, you could be offered as a sacrifice so that you could be the slaves for the, for the really proper height people you know, in life after death. Anyway, I just thought you might be interested in that. Uh, but but uh, what that illustrates is that in all parts of the world, um, human sacrifice was a, a very widespread way that people thought they could use to get in touch with God. Well, if you believe that you can get in touch with God and you can placate God and you can get on God's side for offering, by offering human sacrifice, then what does that tell you about the character of God? That's what the Old Testament is trying to say. And so the Old Testament, starting with Genesis 1, is trying to explain to people that you cannot worship something that is less than God. If you worship something that's less than God, you can call it God, but it will have a much different character from the God who created you. The God who created you, created you because he likes you. 
because he loves you. He created you good. He declared you to be good. He is grieved, you know, these anthropomorphic words that are all the way through the Bible uh, that show that God is not impassable in the Greek sense. Uh, he is grieved because you are offering your children as human sacrifice. He is grieved because the only thing you can think about all day long is violence, as it says in the story of Noah. He is grieved because you are mistreating your neighbor. He is grieved because you are, you are hurting your, uh, your neighbor's wife. He's grieved because you are hurting your neighbor's children or you're hurting your neighbor's parents or whatever. Uh, so the whole law and the whole covenant then is based on I, you, I am the God who chose you. I came looking for you because you couldn't find me. When you tried to find God, you found Moloch. When you tried to find God, you found Chemosh. When you find, tried to find God, you found Baal. And so, in a sense, God is saying, I got tired of waiting for you to find me because you can't find me. You are lousy God finders. So God has to come and find you. And when I, when I find you, I redeem you. I redeem you from the gods of Egypt. And then I tell you, I am the God who redeemed you from the God of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me. And if you have no other gods before me, then you will not kill. You will not commit adultery. You will not steal. You will not, you will not uh, you know, offer your children as human sacrifices. That's the least I can expect out of you if you are my, if you're in covenant with me. Because that's my character. I don't want to eat children. Now that's that's kind of a graphic way of putting it, but but uh, uh, evidently a lot of modern people need a little bit of graphic way of putting it in order to understand uh, that uh, that the Bible is talking about the character of God as opposed to the character of all the other gods that people worshipped. If you for instance, are a Babylonian and uh, you believe, as the Babylonian myth says, that human beings are either a mold that, has, that is growing on the dead body of Tiamat, the mother goddess who has been killed by her grandson, and human beings are a kind of a mold that grows on her body, or that human beings are created by the gods to be slaves. If, that's your, if that is your concept of what a human being is, that's the mythological concept of what a human being was in Babylonian mythology, then what will your ethics be? If human beings are a mold or are slaves, then how, what will your ethics be? How will you relate to human beings? What will you consider human beings to be? So, uh, so the interesting thing is that uh, the, the main theme in the Bible is the righteousness of God. But one of the main sub-themes in the Bible is the overcoming of a concept of God as horror. There's no such thing as the righteousness of Moloch. There's no such thing as the righteousness of Baal. They do not have righteousness. Their character is not consistent with righteousness. So it does make a difference what you believe, if you're sincere. <laughs> uh, I have a little statue at home that my wife hates. Um, because I bought it as a part of my religious collection. I, I, I kind of collect religious artifacts. I have, for instance, I do have a uh, bail that's about that big and that, uh, according to the guy I bought it from, is dated about 2000 BC. And uh, 
I almost broke it the first day I had it, which uh, means that people ought not let me have anything because this thing lasted for 3,000 years until I got hold of it. But anyway, uh, it was broken when my office was moved. One of its ears were broken off, and so it lasted 3,000 years till I got a hold of it. But anyway, I do have a collection of, uh, of these kind of things. I have, a, I have a, an Astaroth, which is about the same age, rock. And uh, this statue that I bought is about this tall, and it is a statue of, of, uh, of somebody from uh, New Guinea who has a spear in one hand and has a severed head in the other hand. And my wife wants to know why in the world I would want a statue of a man with a severed head. It's because I want eventually to put a little tag on the bottom that says it doesn't make any difference what you believe as long as you're sincere. It does make a difference what you believe. It does make a difference what your, what your concept of the character of ultimate reality is. Is ultimate reality friendly? Or would ultimate reality just as soon step on you as look at you? That's that's the difference between the concept of the righteousness of God and alternative concepts. So the reason why, according to the Bible, you want to have a relationship with this God is because you know his character. And if you know his character, then when you turn around to your neighbor, you want to treat your neighbor the way this God would treat him, the way this God would treat you. So the covenant promulgates the justice of God on earth. God's righteousness becomes the plumb line for measuring the rightness of human relationships. Uh, and fortunately, from the biblical perspective, it's possible for that plumb line to be provided by someone else besides Moloch. Or for that matter, nature, because basically the mythological gods are what? They're the personifications of nature. That's the reason why even Thomas Huxley was, was uh, just uh, mortified at the idea that some people were trying to base ethics on Darwin's theory of evolution. Now, Thomas Huxley was an agnostic, and but his ethic was still basically an ethic that he had derived from his Victorian Christianity. He had all kinds of bad things to say about Victorian Christian ministers and uh, the stupidity of them and, and the intolerance of them and so forth, which probably most modern theologians and ethicists would agree with. But Thomas Huxley was just mortified by the, by the attempt of some of his contemporaries to base ethics on the theory of evolution, which later was named what? Social Darwinism. That's what William Jennings Bryan was horrified about. So in, in that sense, William Jennings Bryan and Thomas Huxley agreed that we were in mortal danger as a culture if we based our ethics on nature. That is, if we based our ethics on, the, on Darwin's theory of evolution. From Thomas Huxley's perspective, there's got to be somewhere else where we can get our ethics because the ethics that he believed in were in opposition to the ethics of the survival of the fittest. So, uh, and it's interesting that one of uh, Thomas Huxley's descendants, Julian Huxley, in 19... Uh, in 1959, at the Darwinian Centennial, gave a speech in which he proposed his concept of, of uh, religion without revelation, in which he tried to establish ethics on the basis of Darwinism. Well, Darwin knew better than that. Thomas Huxley knew better than that. If you're going to have an ethic, it's going to have to be an ethic which actually confronts and contradicts the history of biology. 
Now there's a there's a modern int- uh, attempt to to uh, explicate a consistent biological ethic, and uh, it's still in the process of developing. But uh, and it may uh, it may be more uh, intelligent and profound than Thomas Huxley anticipated. But Thomas Huxley would certainly have been opposed to an evolutionary ethic. Ethic may have developed, but it did not develop based on biological evolution. It, ba- it developed, in a sense, in opposition to biological evolution. Because Thomas Huxley was against slavery. He was against uh, survival of the fittest. He was against injustice and so forth. In other words, he recognized that his ethic did not come from evolutionary sources. He couldn't, he couldn't bring himself to uh, identify with contemporary Christian ethics, but he still was not about to identify himself with evolutionary ethics. So since the covenanted community has no charter for existence apart from God's act. The foundation and constitution of her her justice must be held in his righteousness. If God paid particular attention to the case of an enslaved people, as he did when he smote Egypt, If he pays special attention to the case of the poor and the outcast, the widow and the orphan, the sojourner or the resident alien, if he has a particular regard for the helpless ones of earth to rescue them from the clutches of those that are stronger than they, then there must be a corresponding quality in the life of his people so long as they remain his people. Now, this is what Nietzsche calls servile ethics, the ethics of weakness. And so, you have a choice. (laughs) Nietzsche is correct. You have a choice. You have a choice between an ethic of the pagan German gods or the ethic of the God of Israel, who who is the protector of the weak, protector of the poor. Numerous passages in the scripture enjoin the doing of justice, mishpat, and righteousness, tzedek, or define what is good or what the Lord requires as only to do justice, mishpat, and to love kindness, kesed, and to walk humbly with your God. Now, as Ramsey points out, there is... Another kind of justice which the Bible talks about taking place or occurring at the gate. There were judges who sat at the gate of Israelis, ancient Israeli cities, cities. And if you wanted to get corrective justice, you would go to one of these judges sitting at the gate. And the judges sitting at the gate were wise men. They had proverbs. Proverbs was kind of their stock in trade. And so if you wanted to know what to do in terms of a a normal injustice, you went to that person and tried to get some relief. So in that sense, these judges or these elders that sat at the gate kind of took the place in ancient culture of, uh, of judges and psychologists and you know, just about everybody in, mo- uh, in modern society that's a helping person. And that's one kind of justice, where you try to get corrective justice. But there's another kind of justice, and that's the justice that talks about uh, what I've called all along a proactive justice. That's not just the correction of some wrong that's been done to you, but it's the, it's the positive act of kindness our love, our righteousness toward the poor and the weak and so forth. In other words, just like God is kind, was kind of tired of waiting for you to find him, 
you should get tired of waiting for the weak and the poor to find you. You should go find them. Give justice to the weak and the orphan. Do right by the afflicted and the wretched. Set free the weak and the needy. Rescue them from the hands of the wicked. All of these statements. Hear the cases between your fellow countrymen and judge right between a man and his fellow or the resident alien in his employ. You must never show partiality in a case. You must hear high and low alike, standing in fear of no man, for the judgment is God's. Whatever judgment you make is in line with that plumb line from God. So here beyond question, judging all right in any case, true justice receives its decisive definition by reference to the standard of God's righteous judgment. Human justice is entirely articulated with the justice of God. And the reason for this is also given for the judgment is ultimately God's. That is the sense in which God is ultimately behind judgment with respect to morality. It's not just that God is uh, judging you by some external plumb line. It's that God is judging you by his own character. In other words, I am the God who created you. I didn't create you to uh, mistreat people. I didn't create you to... Uh, misuse the humble or the poor or the weak. Now all of these sayings, you see, this, is, this again is not, a, is not a rational ethic. So it's not as, it's, it's not as uh, rationally explicable or comprehensively articulated as Aristotle's ethics. You're, you're just kind of pointed to examples of how it manifests itself. In other words, what does the righteousness of God look like? It looks like this. You take care of the poor. And all of this is comprehended if you want a, if you want a statement of principle, even though that's not a biblical concept. If you want a statement of principle, it's love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And all of these verses are examples of of how that look, what that looks like. And that's the way Jesus does it. When Jesus, uh, when, when somebody wants to know what God is like, Jesus does not say, well, God is omnipotent, he's omniscient, he's omnipresent, he's impassable. What does he say? There was a there was a man <laughs> who had two sons. Then he tells the story. And by the time you hear the story, you have, you have been shown what, what, it, what it looks like to be God. What God acts like. He acts like, he acts like this man who had two sons. Now, we'll, we'll talk about that story later on because that's one of the stories that shows us or paints for us the meaning of Christian ethics. But basically, I'll say this, that the man that Jesus talks about in order to illustrate who God is, is very different from the cultural norm. He does not act like an ordinary father acts. Because God does not act like an ordinary father acts in a, in a Middle Eastern culture. And so uh, we'll, we'll do that story thoroughly because um, uh, if you remember the context of that story, Jesus is not answering an abstract question. What the question he's answering is, why do you eat with prostitutes? He was having lunch with prostitutes. 
So they ask him, you know, the religious uh, establishment asked him, why do you eat at prostitutes? And he said, well, because there was a man who had two sons. In other words, uh, nothing philosophical or rationalistic about this. You just have to try to understand somehow the character of God. And you can only do that by hearing the story. So, so the, the whole Bible is story from beginning to end, not philosophy. Okay, we will uh, pick up there next time.